we noticed that at different times in history, we do have certain um, readings uh, in the Quran that they were excluded from, you know, what we call now the canon. So uh, we call basically the first stage what everyone is familiar with, the Uthmanic Codex. And this is the first canonization process where uh, the uh, readings or the codices of the companions of Muhammad, uh, they were excluded based on the Codex of, uh, of Uthman. So even though Uthman's attempt to limit the variants of the Quran to one Codex, um, variant readings kept multiplying. And this is evident uh, from the early works of grammar and exegesis that we have, that you have uncontrollable amount of variants that Muslims were using and circulating among themselves. Uh, so the second canonization uh, is what Ibn Mujahid did out of a corpus of, I don't want to say unlimited, but many, many uh, readings that existed back then, probably as many as 50, uh, as sources tell us. Um, he uh, chose seven readings. Um, so, and also in Ibn Mujahid's system, when he chose the seven readings, each reading was not unique. So you can see also there are differences within one reading. Uh, so we find many readings in Ibn Mujahid uh, that uh, people stopped reciting today and even stopped reciting 300 years you know, after him. Um, he also disagrees, you know, I think seven or eight uh, times with the canonical readings them, themselves. Uh, he also has a lot of, uh, <clears throat> I think I counted 64 transmission errors in his book where he said that there's this transmission is wrong. This is wrong. It should be this way. It should be that way. But around 150 years later on um, in, in North Africa and Muslim Spain back then. Uh, so we have Abu Amr al-Dani and the Shatabi, both of them. They were scholars of Qiraat. And they were mainly responsible for limiting those different variations or different students and limiting them into two only. So people dislike the fact that you are limiting them to a canon. Why are you limiting us to two per one, uh, i.e. 14 uh, transmissions? And we have more readings, we have more variations. Three, four hundred years later, Ibn al-Jazari in the ninth century, Hijri, um, Islamic calendar, so that would be around the 1400s, uh, he came and added three more readings to those seven by Ibn Mujahid. So that's the fourth period where really the system of 10 readings or 10 canonical readings, what we call them. And then what I call the fifth canonization, uh, it's the 1923-1924 Cairo edition of the, of the Quran based on Hassan Asan. Most Muslims became familiar with that variety, mainly due to the publication, you know, of that codex or that, you know, Mus'haf in Cairo. Um, even though we have, of course, other uh, editions from other readers, but most people are familiar still, even until today, familiar with that with that uh, variety. How how do we understand this concept of tawatur vis-a-vis qiraat or variant readings uh, when uh, many accounts from the classical sources do not agree with this concept of tawatur? Uh, in the early period. Muslims did not talk about this concept of tawatur. And it's very evident that, you know, the variant readings were local. So people in Damascus were transmitting things different, you know, from people of Kufa or people from Mecca and Medina. And the reading or the variant reading was a, um, a, um, a local thing rather than a widely transmitted um, a system that every single Muslim or even every single scholar knew of. If you don't have variant reading, you have you can't read the Quran. That's it's as simple as this. Just you need the vowels, and you need diacritics in order to read it. Uh, there's a you know you can't read the Quran using your own opinion. And that's you know in the Islamic tradition you have to rely on how your you know master taught it and how his master taught it. Uh, so you can't just you know do textual criticism. You, you, you can, of course, but you may not within the tradition. Uh, so there's a difference between someone who is, um, you know, who has a manuscript and say, okay, I'm going to do textual criticism. I'm going to read the Quran on my own. And some scholar did that, you know, back, back in the days. Uh, but of course, you know, they were uh, reprimanded. Um, so this is, um, uh, this is a little bit problematic problematic from the sense of documentation we don't have enough documentation from the early period and we don't know how much 
writing and orality were intertwined back then. And I'm talking here, eighth century, okay? Um, there was a time when the Quran was codified during the time of Uthman, when orality lost to written transmission. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that Muslim scholars all agreed that regardless of your memory, regardless of how you memorize the Quran, you cannot deviate from the Uthmanic codex. So even though certain readers, they were sure of how they memorized the Quran uh, through other channels. And, you know, they were saying that I have a good chain of transmission. You know, I studied with, you know, X and, you know, Y and Z, you know, people. Muslim scholars post-Uthmanic post period, they didn't care. As long as you are deviating from the text, we are not going to accept your reading. So when someone tells you, well, the Quran was already transmitted regardless of the Rasim, regardless of, of the Uthmanic um, uh, consonantal text, that's not accurate. There's no such thing as only oral transmission. You have to oral transmission based on the text. So okay. there are even transmissions on behalf of the canonical readers, which were also classified as shawath, as irregular not accepted there are also readings attributed to the prophet himself you know we have a category in, in qiraat it's called the readings of the prophet okay and there are uh, you know three or four books even written on that in in arabic um even though we do have accounts that go back to the prophet saying that he read this word as such this word was also categorized as irregular or shawaf but it's just like they didn't care as long as the readings deviate from the Uthmanic Codex, we will consider them to be irregular or shallow. Even though we know that the Prophet might have read as such, and we, might, when we also know that the other companions might have read as such. However, the Codex of Uthman abrogated all other codices, abrogated all other readings, and we are going to stick with that. We also have you know, information from Iraq, from Kufa, that people kept reading according to the codices, let's say, of Ibn Mas'ud, even you know, 150 years after Uthman. So it's, it's uncontrollable in a sense. People were still reading according to the codex of Ibn Mas'ud, which is different from the codex of, of Uthman. In Ibn Mas'ud is very interesting because uh, we, we, you know, as also many people pointed out, you know, we have so many accounts about his rejection and his um, uh, opposition, right, to uh, uh, to the committee that Osman formed. And he was saying, you know, I'm one of those uh, senior companions uh, of the Prophet. Um, he was criticizing Zaid bin Thabit, the head of the committee. You know, you were a little kid playing with the with the with the other kids, and you know, your forelock was dangling you know from your from your head while i was taking the quran fresh from the from the mouth of the prophet we always have to remember uh very reading system readings or eponymous readings are very very attached to geography even until today if you talk to people you know in morocco they are very proud of their Warsh reading you have people in africa they're very conservative about abu amr ibn al-ala you know people are attached locally to their reading and this was the case also back then. People in Kufa, they were, you know, groupies in a sense. It was the group of Ibn Mas'ud. And they, they did not want to uh, abandon the reading of Ibn Mas'ud for political reasons, you know. There's a lot of politics happening uh, back then. And we do have, actually, there is an interesting account, uh, which you don't find in other, um, in other accounts. There is, um, uh, you know, some kind of tension between um, Zaid bin Thabit and Ibn Mas'ud. And actually, it's, sorry, Ibn al-Arabi, Ibn al-Arabi, not, not, uh, not Ibn Khaldun, the, uh, the jurist. He said that people claimed that uh, Uthman and, you know, sent someone to beat Ibn Mas'ud. It even reached, you know, the, uh, the stage of beating him and breaking, you know, some of his rib bones because of his opposition to, uh, you know, to the Codex of Uthman. Unfortunately, we don't have manuscripts from that period, but... Uh, it is very interesting. Um, the, this paradox is that the um, you know the Quran is transmitted uh, via tawatur. We have different ways of reading it. Um, how did you know these eponymous readings uh, or system readings? How were they transmitted? Were they also transmitted via tawatur? And you know the answer is also problematic because. 
it seems that in the early period, they were not thinking this concept of tawatur was not applicable to, to qira'at, okay? Uh, it was basically a local thing, you know? It was, this is the reading of the community, let's say, of Kufa or the community of Medina. Later on, uh, what we call the usulis, the, the scholars of usul al-fiqh, uh, principles of jurisprudence, they came up with this principle of tawatur. However, uh, other scholars also, they oppose this notion because the, the criteria of tawatur doesn't apply to these. And this is why, but let's say 5th century, 6th century, that would be 11th century, 12th century, there were scholars who were calling for this criteria of tawatur because you do, you do want the Qur'an to be mutawatur. If the Qur'an is not mutawatur, that's a big problem. You, you know, it is the main source, um, it is the principal book of Islam. And if the variant readings, the way you access this text are not mutawatira, then you do have a very a theological problem. Um, and that's the paradox here. And this is why scholars were back and forth, um, you know, even by the time of Ibn al-Jazari, he, he died 833, so that would be, you know, 15th century. Uh, his, in his early life, he was fighting for this concept of tawatira. He said, well, all the qiraat uh, are mutawatira. Uh, but then, you know, later on, he he did change his mind. You know, especially in the past, I would say, 200 years, there isn't a single book of introduction to Quranic sciences except that they say, well, the variant readings are transmitted via Tawatur. They picked up that word. However, you know, where's the footnote? We go to the sources and we see that that's not the case. Can you really prove, um, you know, the, uh, the Tawatur? of Qira'at at every single stage back to the Prophet. Was this the case 500 years ago or 600 years ago? And when we see things change over time, we start asking questions. Well, you know, the way we have the Qira'at now are different from the way people were reciting. And we, unfortunately, we don't have, uh, you know, much documentation from that period to give, you know, a, um, you, know an, you know, an answer or an opinion based on facts, but uh, you know, based on these few accounts of why Uthman did, why Uthman did this. And at, actually at every single stage of what I'm calling canonization, the reason why you want to standardize is because you have differences. You don't just come and then you want to standardize something if it's already standardized. You know, you can't afford to have different versions of the Quran available uh, among the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the whole, you know, they were, I don't want to say obsessed, but, you know, this was always something that, you know, Muslims were thinking about, that we need to have a standard version. We can't afford having variations. It's to try to get rid of variations and gather all Muslims, you know, on one codex. There are many problematic issues about, you know, the collection, especially the committee that he put, you know. So besides Zaid bin Thabit, or the other three members in the committee, the three of them, they were nine to ten years old when the prophet died. So they were not really senior companions of him. Um, and three of them, they were they married, they were husbands for three of Uthman's daughters. You know, so again, you see how politics here is, you know, very intertwined with, uh, you know, with the decision of who Uthman chose in the committee to um, to standardize the text. So again, you know, politics is very important. You know, people shouldn't uh, dismiss uh, politics and the decision of the state uh, to standardize a text. This happened with Uthman. This happened with Ibn Mujahid. He was the uh, chief, you know, uh, reader uh, in Baghdad. And people who opposed him, like Ibn Shanabud and Ibn Maqsam, um, they were tried, tortured, persecuted, according to sources, imprisoned. Uh, we always look at how state enforced this kind of standardization. Uh, the Arabic script was not developed. Um, you know, it, it was derived from uh, Nabatian, um, as Semitic philologists um, uh, researched and determined. Um, we didn't have vowels, we didn't have diacritics. Um, yes, there are certain ambiguous passages uh, in the Quran that you do need vowels and diacritics, and this is why readers disagreed. The disagreement are on those, uh, in these cases, where you don't know if you should use passive or active. Uh, you don't know who the subject is. You don't know how to conjugate, you know, the verb, uh, the prefix. And you know, we even have manuscripts in Arabic, you know, uh, even up, 
even you know six seven hundred years after dots and diacritics were developed where you don't have diacritics mm -hmm. so so diacritics and vowels are not the main reason they are one of the reasons they are one of the reasons there are very very obvious cases where because you don't have diacritics and vowels there were variant readings it's very obvious it has nothing to do with dialects has nothing to do with um you know plurality it has nothing to do with uh different modes it has to do with the script right and also muslim scholars are divided so you know a group a group would say that al hajjaj did introduce reformation of the script and other scholars say no he didn't right and i do believe i i'm i'm inclined to say that actually he did include you know certain you know uh, reformation in the text okay so usually of course we have contradictory accounts in islamic tradition everything there isn't there isn't a single thing that we don't have contradictory contradictory uh, tr traditions about mm -hmm. the point is even if it wasn't al hajjaj you know let's say it wasn't him this person specifically we do know that there were certain reformations in the early manuscripts so you have the language of pre-islamic poetry and the language of the quran they are very similar okay uh, in terms of syntax vocabulary etc and even if someone like a tabari who's an exegete he's always quoting grammarians mm. so grammarians are authority number one when it comes to variant readings the uh, muslim scholars later on clashed with grammarians because grammarians would be criticizing some variant readings i would say well this this reading is not grammatical this reading is not good and later uh, muslim scholars who wanted to say well all the readings were correct god doesn't speak bad arabic and this is why someone like a tabari or people or zamakhshari or even ibn atiyah you know those exegetes you know they were saying well wait a second this reading is really not grammatical this is bad arabic uh, this is arabs would never say something like that and what happened is that a dani uh, he was you know he died mid fifth century mid, mid 11th century and he said i'm going to limit myself you know to two transmitters per reader so that it would be easier for people to memorize these variants and it became very successful and it was it started to be taught at different schools and what made it more popular is that 100 years after dani a shatabi became and then he versified this manual into a poem he versified it put and poetry is is you know it's uh, very important in the arabic tradition you memorize things through didactic poems well, we don't want people to think that the readings are the ahruf because mm -hmm. as i said multiple times no one knows what the ahruf is and if someone tells you that he or she knows what the ahruf is well no one knows so we take the word of muslim scholars who spent years and years and years trying to understand what the ahruf are and no one knows mm -hmm. uh, there are speculations but at the end of the day they're only speculations is there um a consensus on the number of readings today you have three groups you have one group that will tell you seven they have the other group that would tell you 10 and you have a smaller group that would tell you 14. Um, so the system of the 14 you know has been around for the past 200 300 years people were you know trying to add four readings so that's yeah. why um uh, going back to to early sources and reading you know these documents it gives us you know a, a good map of what people thought at different periods of time and not to apply you know certain notions that um, people believe in now uh, but they were not existent existent you know um, centuries before